my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Babylist. The people at Babylist believe that you should be able to get exactly what you need for your unique and growing family. That's why their baby registry easily lets you add any item from any store. Plus, Babylist helps you each step of the way with their customized checklist, product guides, and reviews. And their personal registry consultants are there for you whenever you need. They've even got group gifting. Start your registry today to be eligible for a free Hello Baby box of goodies for baby worth over $100 while boxes last. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Sarah about her experience using Babylist. If you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon group. This is where listener supporters can pledge $5 or more a month to help support the birth hour and its mission. If the birth hour has added to your life in some way, we would love for you to consider supporting us by going to patreon.com slash birth hour. And for the remainder of the year, we have a special discount going on for the month of December, where when you pledge an annual membership, you get two months free. Typically, the annual membership comes with one month free, so this is a great opportunity to get a couple extra months for free and more value for your membership. And that applies to all of the tiers except for the $1 level, which is just our archived episodes. All of our listener supporters have access to bonus content, as well as an exclusive Facebook group created just for you. The members of that group are so amazing and the support we give one another there has had such an impact on my life and I know it has for so many others who find our group to be a safe place to ask questions, share concerns, and get genuine and loving feedback from those who have been where they are or are going through something similar. We also do regular Zoom calls in there as well. So again, if you head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, you can get started and show your support for the birth hour. I will link to that right in the podcast app show notes as well. And you'll be able to see all the different perks you get at the different levels, including our co-producer level, which is $10 a month and comes with access to our second podcast, the partner podcast, where my husband interviews partners about their perspective on pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. So again, head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, and we would love to have your support. I also want to be sure to remind everyone to check out our Know Your Options online childbirth course. If you're looking for childbirth education, this is an evidence-based course that covers everything from the final weeks of pregnancy through preparing for birth, no matter what type of birth you're planning, we cover it all. And then we go into postpartum and nursing as well. Check out all of that at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's thebirthhour.com slash course. All right, today's guest is Kelly, and she's going to be sharing her hospital induction birth story, and then she's going to be sharing her story of having a miscarriage. She shares it in a lot of detail, which I know is going to be really helpful for listeners, but I also want people to take care if they're not in a good spot to listen to this right now. Kelly's episode will finish up on Thursday with part two, where she shares her rainbow baby's birth story. All right, let's get to Kelly's episode. Hi, Kelly. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Brand. Thank you so much for having me on. Will you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Sure. My name is Kelly. I live in Marietta, Georgia. That's about 20 minutes north of downtown Atlanta uh, with my husband, Stephen. We've been married for 11 years and we have two daughters, um, Estella, who is four, and Pearl, who is five weeks old. And I teach English at Kennesaw State University um, here in Kennesaw, and my husband is a land surveyor. All right. Let's start with your first pregnancy and what that looked like for you. Yeah. So (laughs) Stephen and I, we always kind of joke about that if he could have had the baby, we would have had our first baby like several years (laughs) before we actually did. (laughs) Um, I was kind of the one that sort of had to come around to the idea. I I had always wanted children, but I just kind of wasn't sure when. So um, when I was 30, well, I'm 37 now, but when I was 30, I decided to go for my PhD in English and it was kind of, all right, it's now or never. And so, you know, kids kind of got put on the back burner for a while. 
And then um, when I was ABD, which is all but dissertation, I, well, Stephen and I decided that it was time to start trying. And so I had my IUD removed and um, I got pregnant. It was like the second month, which I was kind of surprised by actually, just because I know personally a lot of women who have had trouble getting pregnant. And so like my sister included. And so I wasn't like thinking that it would be super quick. Um, and, and it kind of was, and, and I will say like, I mean, I was happy about it. (laughs) Um, and my husband was also very happy about it, but I, I was a little, you know, uh, uncertain, I think just kind of while I was pregnant, you know, just that not sure how good of a mother you're going to be. And I still had my dissertation to write and we lived in Illinois at the time. That's where I was getting my PhD. And so that's about eight hours away from home. So to have that family support uh, and all of that kind of stuff. So I was just a little bit nervous, I guess, about it, but we were both very happy. And so I think I was maybe six weeks along and I thought, well, maybe I'm going to be one of those lucky women that doesn't get sick. And that was not the case. Uh, So like at six weeks, I started throwing up a lot and I was very, very nauseous and sick for, for many, many weeks. Like I think I was maybe 25 weeks when it finally subsided. And they did give me... I think it was called diclegis. Um, and so I had, I was taking something, but you know, it didn't help as much as I think I, I certainly wanted to. I don't know. You just sort of make it through, right? Like you just one day to the next. But other than that, it was very, you know, low risk and very smooth, no complications, anything like that. The only thing I'd really known about birth was just kind of what everybody else did, which is, you know, you you go to an OB practice and you have a hospital birth and you most likely get an epidural. And so I I don't know. I think at that time, I just kind of wasn't questioning or kind of even considering that there could be an alternative to that. And so, you know, we, that that was kind of my birth plan, um, sort of what everybody else sort of did, including my sister, you know, she had um, three, three children and all were hospital inductions. And so um, I think I just kind of thought that that's just sort of what you do. Though I will say the one, one thing that I did do that my sister had not done was hire a doula. She was really great, like during the pregnancy, we met regularly and she was, you know, very helpful and we talked about a lot of things, but one thing that we did not talk about, which I think, you know, it was obviously in hindsight, I wish we would had was what her role was going to be during the actual labor and delivery, which will kind of play a role when I get to the birth story of my being disappointed uh, by that. My favorite part, I guess, of the whole pregnancy was filling her move. Um, That was by far my favorite part. So yeah, I think that was that's pretty much the main part of the pregnancy. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start with how labor started. So at 40 weeks, I went in for a, a non-stress test and everything, you know, looked great and uh, there were no, you know, concerns on the non-stress test, but they immediately started talking about induction. I have to say, I mean, it was in so many words, uh, they said, you know, if we don't induce and you don't have your baby like right now, then your placenta is just going to give out and your baby might not make it. <laughs> right. I mean, like I said, they didn't say it in those words, but it definitely was the the feeling that I, I got that I needed to induce like right now. And of course, knowing what I know now, um, after listening to, you know, tons of, uh, birth stories here on your podcast and also doing my own research, I realize it's not the case that it's not at 40 weeks, your placenta just decides to, to give out, but that is something that they made me feel. And so I, I was like, okay. And so we, um, made that plan to induce, I was 40 weeks and three days. And so I, I went in at 8 p.m. and they gave me Cervidil and uh, that was in overnight. Um, So I guess from about maybe 9 p.m. until the morning and maybe 6 a.m., something like that. And then they took it out, which of course, you know, Cervidil is just simply to ripen or soften the cervix to get things moving along. Um, Because at that point I I had no, you know, no effacement, no dilation um, or anything like that. And then they started me on Pitocin at, I think it was about 9 a.m. in the morning. And uh, my water broke on its own at 11 in the morning. My husband and I are like, okay, you know, things are getting going. And 
it was a long haul and we didn't really know what was ahead of us. We were kind of taking as it comes. And so my doula was coming. She came in like right as they were starting the Pitocin. And she did say that it it could be quite a while when you are inducing. And so I said, okay. But then she said that she had to go and run some errands or something like that. And that she was just going to let me and Stephen sort of be there at the hospital and, and, and start the process. And um, I said, okay. And then around, I think it was probably about three or four hours later that that's when my contractions started to pick up and were definitely starting to become, you know, more painful. And so I asked for the epidural at that point. So I, I got that which was really not a big deal. It was very smooth, like getting it in was very smooth and painless. Um, But my blood pressure plummeted like right away. And so they had to put me on oxygen to kind of regulate that. And then after that, Stephen and I just sort of hung out in the room and, uh, you know, watched TV, just kind of were, were trying to pass the time. I was definitely getting very tired though, because, you know, I had been, I guess we were about 24 hours into it. And while I wasn't in a, you know, a lot of pain, I I just was so tired and so exhausted and I wanted to go to sleep. And, you know, I'd heard that when you get the epidural, you can often, you know, you get that pain relief so you, you can rest and sleep. But for some reason, I just couldn't seem to go to sleep. So I would say it was probably about maybe 2 a.m. And I started to feel a lot of pain in my back. And so I asked the the nurse, I said, you know, is this normal that I'm feeling this type of pain? What were essentially back contractions, even though I had the epidural? And she said, yeah, that can happen. And there's really nothing we can do about it. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's something I didn't know um, that you could still end up feeling a lot, even with the epidural, even when it's working. I mean, because it was working before that. So at this point, I really needed my doula um, to kind of make it through those contractions. And she was nowhere to be found. Um, She had gone home to sleep. And she hadn't really been part of this process really much at all the whole time. Like I said, I, I was very disappointed by that. I don't know if it was just an assumption that I had that she would be there the whole time, uh, maybe to step out to, to get something to eat, perhaps, but but that she would be, you know, with me a majority of that time, you know, no matter how long that took. So she wasn't there. And so my mother in law actually came in the room and uh, was helping me through those contractions, just kind of breathing through, you know, deep breaths and deep breaths out. And she was very crucial for my, you know, basically making it through those two hours before it was time for me to push. So then, yeah, I guess I would say it was probably about four in the morning and the OB came in and he uh, checked me and said, okay, I think you are ready to to push. Are you ready? And I said, yes, yes, I'm ready. (laughs) And since it had been, you know, over 30 hours, I was just so ready for that, you know, to change and, and for us to kind of move for that last leg of the journey. And so I pushed and he said, okay, yeah, that, that was great. Um, except we're going to do that again times a hundred. I said, oh, okay. And I didn't really know, you know, yeah, like what push meant or really how to do it and, and all of that. So I was like, oh, okay, like I've just got to push harder. And of course, you know, having the epidural, it, it makes that process, I think, more difficult just because you you don't really know how hard you are or aren't pushing. And so uh, just to kind of have that feedback that I need to push harder than I was. So at this point, though, my doula has arrived. And so she's holding a leg and my husband, Stephen's holding the other leg. And so he is helping me, like he's counting for me to push and then I can rest and breathe and then push and rest and breathe. And uh, it was about 45 minutes, I'll say. And then she, you know, she was out and they put her, you know, directly on my chest. And I was holding her, I think it was maybe like a minute or something like that. Like it was a very short amount of time. And then I remember a nurse said to me, we need to take her and check on her. And I thought, well, that's strange because I thought she could just stay with me. And I suppose just in that after birth experience or in the haze or something, I didn't realize, but um, my husband told me later that she was turning blue and um, yeah, I just didn't realize it. And so they took her over into the corner of the room and started giving her oxygen. 
So Stephen tells me that she's having some trouble keeping her oxygen levels up. Like she's breathing, but she just can't keep the oxygen levels up, which they weren't sure, you know, why that was. Just, you know, some babies can just have a little bit more trouble transitioning into the world, or it could be something else, you know, uh, infection or something like that. So they whisk her away to the NICU. And I was just very, I think, kind of, you know, emotional about that because, like she was inside of me, then she was in the corner of the room, and then she's out of the room. And, I, and I'm just kind of like, like, what's going on? And so it was just very, it was very not what I had imagined. <laughs> um, like it wasn't going in any way that I wanted it to. You know, it was going to be the golden hour, and I was going to have her for that time, and we were going to establish breastfeeding, and, and it was just going to be me, her, and Stephen, and, and all of that. And it just, it wasn't that. And so I had to stay in bed for, I think it was probably almost a couple of hours. They had to sew me up. I had a a second degree tear. So they stitched me up from that. And then um, I had to wait. It was at least an hour before I could get up once they had turned the epidural off before I could um, stand up and walk to go to the NICU to see her. And so then finally I was able to, um, which by the way, my husband was able to go and, and be with her in the NICU. So she wasn't alone. And so I went in there and I just remember like scrubbing in to go into the NICU and um, walking in and seeing her, or maybe I was being rolled in in the wheelchair, but seeing her you know, hooked up to IVs and she had a, a CPAP on her mouth and nose and helping her breathe. And, and I just, again, just remember thinking like, this is not how it was supposed to be. And it was just very surreal. You know, my, my mind goes to, she's going to die. Like it goes to worst case scenario. And I don't know if that's something that all new moms sort of experience or, you know, if it was the hormones or of course the, the lack of sleep, um, cause I had not slept uh, since probably about definitely, uh, you know, over 24 hours before that or eaten. And yeah, so it was just a lot. And they did let me hold her. Um, It was maybe 12 hours after she was born. They let me hold her. And then it was 24 hours later that she was able to come to our room. So, but of course that sort of plays a role in, in the breastfeeding journey as well, because I had to begin pumping like right away. So that was, you know, something that I had not planned on doing. And so we actually ended up having to use a nipple shield for a few months. And I'm quite sure that it's because of that, that I wasn't able to breastfeed her right away. But, you know, we eventually transitioned off of that and and it was fine. But I think it's just, you know, you have an idea of how you imagine things going. And then when they don't go that way, it just tends to, I don't know, maybe makes you emotional and you long for, you know, that what you had hoped for and kind of grieve that a little bit. She did end up getting jaundice, so she had to go under the lamps. And so it was the NICU stay, and then it was the lamps and, you know, and all of that. And so it was just kind of one thing after another. So we were finally released, you know, for going in just to, you know, to have this induction and leave. It was a week that we had to stay in the hospital. So that was unexpected, but we kind of made it through and, you know, came home. And I would say, of course, in those first, you know, weeks, that was pretty tough. Certainly the sleeplessness and all of that. And I'd had depression before. And so I think I knew maybe better than some, you know, what the warning signs were to look out for. And it never got there, which I'm certainly very thankful for. But, you know, it was, yeah, definitely more of just sort of the baby blues and and that kind of thing. But overall, I'll say like once we got home and she was fine and, and everything was going to be OK and just kind of settling into, you know, what life looked like as this family of three, it ended up being just fine. So I think emotionally and mentally, it was, I think, kind of as good as it could be. You know, certainly some rough kind of challenging moments as, as all new moms have. But in general, it was pretty smooth. Physically, on the other hand, <laughs> it was really tough. Like I said, I had a second degree tear 
But um, I think I just wasn't prepared for like how much it hurt. Like I knew, yes, you're going to bleed a lot and uh, it's going to be uncomfortable and all of those kinds of things. But I didn't realize that it was going to be quite as bad as it was. And so I would say the one thing that helped me through the worst of it was ice packs. And that was, yeah, I would say like just kind of constantly using those for weeks and ibuprofen and all of that kind of helped me get through that the best that I could. And and then with breastfeeding, uh, again, you know, we had the nipple shield at first, but then transitioned off of it and successfully breastfed for, I believe she was like 20 months. um, And she just kind of weaned herself. And then it was just, you know, we were done with that. So um, I'm, I'm thankful for that, that it wasn't something that we had to struggle with. So that's the story of Estella. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that first story. And um, I'd love to hear about just the decision to have another and how that went for you guys. Yeah, sure. So we started to think about having another child. I told my husband that I needed to finish writing my dissertation baby (laughs) uh, first. And so I did. I, I finished that and graduated And so at that point, which was our first daughter would have been three and a half when we decided to to start again or try again. So I had my IUD removed again. And I think just from the first time around thought, oh, well, this is going to happen really quickly. But it was, I think, about four months into it. I get pregnant and we're like super excited. You know, I think it's one of those, the first time I was, you know, just kind of really like unsure (laughs) about being pregnant, about becoming a mother. But then when I had Estella, it was just, I mean, I I became the cliche that I just never expected to become, um, just completely in love and completely enamored, you know, with her. And I was just very much like career driven and all of those things kind of before. And, uh, you know, when she was born, it just sort of I don't know. I think it's just your perspective and your priorities shift. And so we were just really, really excited to be pregnant again. When I was about, I was eight weeks and I was going in for my, I think they call it the the pregnancy confirmation uh, visit. And the night before this, I felt very nervous uh, about going. And I thought, well, maybe I'm, I feel nervous about it because Stephen couldn't go with me. I had to go alone, you know, because of the, the COVID rules and that kind of thing. And so I thought maybe that's all it is. And so I was just trying to shrug it off. But so I go for the appointment. And again, I'm waiting on the, the doctor to come in to do the exam and uh, in the room by myself. And, and again, just growing more and more anxious. My heart was beating really fast. And I didn't know like kind of what that was about. And so then she starts doing the ultrasound and she looks at the screen and she looks very confused. And I thought, you know, what's going on? And she, you know, turns the screen to me and says, so, you know, so how far along are you? And I said, eight weeks. And she said, well, what, what I see here is in line more with a six week pregnancy. You know, do you think maybe you have your dates wrong? And, you know, immediately I thought, well, well, no, because I mean, my cycles are, are always very regular. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense to me why I would be, you know, two weeks off of, you know, where, where I thought I was. And she's like, well, and, you know, says the dreaded words, which, you know, are, well, I, I don't see a heartbeat. And, my, you know, of course, I just, my heart just sinks. And I thought, well, my fears are realized, you know, like I knew I was anxious about something. But of course, this is like the worst outcome that I could imagine. And so she said, well, let's check your HCG levels, um, just kind of see what's going on. Um, So we'll check them today. We'll check them again in 48 hours and just kind of, you know, make sure that they are increasing. So, you know, and hopefully, you know, they want to see it double, the numbers double. Hopefully that will be and that your dates are just off. So I leave the office and I just keep thinking like, it's no, something's wrong, something's wrong. So then the next day I'm at home alone and uh, my husband's at work and I'm working from home during the COVID stuff and I'm teaching from home and everything. And so I go to the restroom and I notice blood and I immediately freak out (laughs) Um, and I, I call the doctor and 
uh, she, you know, she's just like, well, do you feel cramping, you know, in addition, like how much blood, you know, all of that. And, and I'm like, it's a lot. And, uh, she's like, okay, well just, just monitor it and, you know, give us a call back in maybe an hour or two. And I said, okay. And so then, uh, I just, I remember just sort of sitting there and I think the, the best word I can use to describe this is a gush. And I thought, whoa, what was that? And like, was that just like that much blood? And I, you know, I looked down and it's not just blood. You know, I had like the, the baby just, you know, I mean, yeah. So, um, was just kind of out and on the floor. Mm. And I thought, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I haven't talked about this in a while. Um, it was just uh, surreal and like an out of body experience. Like I was just kind of watching it happen to someone else. Mm. And um, I'm really glad that that my daughter was at daycare <laughs> because I just remember screaming and crying and uh it was just really scary yeah. and so um so I called my husband and tell him you know what happened and he came home and I, I just like I wasn't sure like what to do mm-hmm. <laughs> like with the baby like I, I know that that's sort of maybe a strange thing but like it didn't feel right to, like to to flush. I I don't know <laughs> exactly how to explain it, but uh, we we ended up burying the baby in the backyard and just kind of, um, you know, praying and uh, it it was just really hard because um, I think you you want so much for things to be okay and Mm -hmm. you expect them to go to go smoothly and and then when they when they don't it's just really uh I I guess you always know there's a risk you know that things like this can happen and I think too it's it's a lot more common yeah than I think we talk about um and admit Mm -hmm. and so it was just really hard and so as I said before I have had some struggles with depression in the past. And so I, I definitely did know that I was heading that way again um, after that happened. And just not feeling enjoyment in things that I used to have and just kind of feeling that sort of snow globe sort of feeling um, where you're living your life, but you don't feel very present. Mm-hmm. Things are just sort of happening around you and to you. And so I told Stephen, I said, I, I really think I need to go talk with someone. And so I did and made a, an appointment with a therapist and it definitely helped. You know, he talked to me about things like being okay with like allowing myself to not be okay. Like it's okay to not be okay and to mourn and to grieve the future that you imagined with that baby. And it's, you know, no less of a loss because it was, you know, early and all those sorts of things. And so, yeah, he, he kind of helped me sort of work through some of those emotions and that grief and, and disappointment. So a couple of months later, Stephen and I thought, well, okay, you know, let's give it another try. And so we did. And I was supposed to get my period on a Sunday and I didn't. I thought, well, okay, well, if I haven't gotten it by Tuesday, then then I'll take a test. And I still hadn't gotten my period. And so I took a test and it immediately was one of the digital ones that say pregnant or not pregnant. And it said pregnant. And I immediately started sobbing. And Stephen came into the bathroom and he's like, are you, you know, you're, are you okay? Because <laughs> I didn't tell him I was about to take the test. And he's like, oh, oh my goodness. Like, are you happy? Are you like, he wasn't sure like why I was reacting the way I was. And it actually wasn't happy. Um, it was kind of more terrified, I'll have to say, because I thought, I just kept saying, I can't go through that again. Like, I, I just, I can't do it again. So I will say though, those first few weeks were really scary for me. 
I mean, and, and it actually wasn't something that stopped. Like every single time I went to the bathroom, I thought I'm going to see blood. And every single time, I mean, I was, you know, well into 30 weeks and, and I still thought, am I going to see blood when I go to the bathroom? Which I, a lot of the narratives that I've read about when you have had a miscarriage, that's a very normal thing to feel, um, to have a sort of that PTSD from that experience. And I know for sure that it affected like having had the miscarriage and, and only like a couple of months before, um, it definitely affected my ability to be excited about this pregnancy or even to bond with the baby. Yeah, I just I just kind of wasn't very excited at all. And I also was really sick again, um, like nauseous. And this time, actually, I didn't throw up a whole lot. I threw up much more with my first uh, child, but it was just a constant like feeling like I could throw up. <laughs> um, and so that was... It's kind of hard to be, you know, excited about much when you feel so miserable. And so, you know, I think that also played a role um, in my like emotional excitement and everything. So, and I knew that fear, that was the emotion that I was feeling a lot of, um, was not something that, you know, comes from God. And so I, I prayed about this a lot and I kept being reminded of a particular Bible story, which is where Jesus is sleeping in the bottom of the boat and his disciples are on top of the boat. And it's like this huge storm. And they say, Jesus, are you going to come save us? Like, do you not, do you not care? And he wakes up and comes up top and says, be still. And the storm quits, right? It's just it's silence. And so I kept being reminded of the story. And all I had to do was ask him to calm that fear, right, um, that I was feeling. And so that also, you know, helped me through that fear emotion for sure. But in those early weeks, I, I did go to the OB, which, by the way, we had moved, right, because I graduated with, with my PhD and we had moved to uh, Marietta which, by the way, is where we're from. We're from Georgia. And so we, we moved back closer to family. And so I had found a new OB to go to here. So I went in to have my HCG levels checked, you know, just kind of make sure everything was was going okay. And this was around like four weeks, so very, very early. And it was. The numbers were doubling and actually kind of tripling. Um, so things are looking good. And the OB even said that I could, if it would make me, you know, have peace of mind that we could do an early ultrasound at six weeks, just kind of see how things were going. And I said, yeah, that, that would be great. So we did. And I told the, the tech, I said, you know, if you, if you could just <laughs> tell me that there is or isn't a heartbeat, <laughs> um, can that be the first thing that you say? And so uh, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a heartbeat right there. You, you can see it like that flicker. That's it. And I cried um, in the office there. And of course, one reason is I was glad. But the other actually was was sadness because I would never, you know, see that heartbeat for the baby that we lost. And so it was kind of bittersweet, um, I suppose. But, you know, it was it was good. All right. We are going to end there for today with Kelly's first half of her story, and we'll hear the rest of her rainbow baby story on Thursday. So stay tuned for that. Now I'm going to chat with Sarah about Babylist, today's sponsor. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Babylist. Hi, Bryn. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners just a little bit about you? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sarah Rainwater. I'm my husband and my two kids, and I live in Prescott, Arizona. We just had our second baby. He's seven weeks old, so I'm pretty fresh on all the baby products. We're small business owners, or I don't like the term small business. We're we're self-employed. We're business owners. So anyways, we're fairly busy folks and having two little ones under two, they're only 18 months apart. It definitely makes us grateful for products like baby list when it comes to planning, you know, like a low key baby shower, like we did with our second. So anyways, I mean, just kind of busy folks, but, but definitely enjoying the parenthood aspect of things as well. So did you use Babylist with your first or just started this time with your second? So I used it with my first, but I used it kind of in a much more low-key way. Um, I feel like with my second, it was much more our prominent uh, registry that we used. And so with our second, you know, I didn't register for 
all the typical firstborn stuff. Like we had nothing with our firstborn and with our second, it was much more targeted to where we needed something from this store or something from that store or, you know, like our, um, our newborn photos or things like that. So we definitely used it much more prominently with our second baby. Yeah, it's so great for adding all those things that aren't traditional baby registry items. That's definitely what I've been using it for this third time around. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because um, I feel like it's just gaining more and more popularity with that. Like even my aunts and my mom, they're just, you know, they're telling everybody about the cool thing that I use for my registry. So like, I think it says in some of your guys' ads, like you can register for dog walks and anyways, so it, it is very much, um, awesome in that area or, you know, register for home cooked meals. And so what we used it for, for things that weren't store bought items was like I said, the, the newborn photos and my maternity photos. And we were able to get both of those, which was really awesome. Cause that's just, you know, an expense that you want to have because you want to have those, um, those photos for the rest of your life. But when you're not registering for, you know, booger suckers, it's easy to register for, for photos and somebody can give you something that you're going to hold on to for the rest of your life. So those are bigger ticket items. Did you have like a grandparent gift you those or did people go in together on them? So I had a couple people and some of my friends go in together on them. And um, I think it made it really, really doable for, for that as well. Yeah, that's so fun. What a like priceless gift to give. I know it is. It really is. Did you mostly use the app or do it on your computer? Um, so I definitely mostly use the app and, um, I am a little bit of a controlly type person. So I also like to see when somebody, you know, got me something that, so it will tell you like something's been chosen off your registry and that way I could, uh, kind of keep inventory, I guess, of what, you know, was coming my way before the little shower barbecue that we had. And then I could, get the rest of the things that I didn't have. So that was another feature that I liked. Um, I made it to where it wouldn't tell me like who bought me it, but I knew when an item was coming. So that's another feature that I liked a lot on the app. And so that's what we, we normally used. Yeah. I like that. It just says like reserved, um, yeah. <laughs> without giving away who gave it for those of us who can't, uh, keep surprises at all. <laughs> <laughs> Except for my father-in-law, he reserved an item or I don't, maybe he bought it. And, but it like, it kind of took a while to come. Cause of course it would, then it was through the actual items website. And I called him and I was like, did you, I'm like, I don't mean to be rude, but did you actually get me this? Or he was like, no, it's coming. I'm like, okay, because if you didn't, I wanted to buy it. So um, anyways, it was kind of, it was a good way to to just keep track of the items that you're getting because we really needed all these items. But like, they weren't, like I said, you know, a blue onesies, like we had all that. We needed the items that were on our registry. Awesome. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you. Thanks for sharing a little bit about it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much again to Kelly for sharing that first half of her story. And thank you to Babyless for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Kelly's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.